I had five or six auto accidents where cars were totaled, divorced twice, broken relationships, angry kids, lost businesses, bankruptcy. All of those issues of life were marker points what God was saying, pay attention. I've been stabbed, I've been shot at, big target, I was missed, close range. God would get me out of situations, you know, and um, I just knew he was real. God became intimate to me. We have an intimate relationship today. Hi, I'm Laverne Tripp and welcome to Born to Be Free because that's the purpose we were born for, to be free. In order to get to that place though, I know for me, I had to reach a place that I believed that there was a power greater than me that could restore me. What do you mean restore you? Well, when the fall took place, when we fell, something happened. And in order to get to the level that we should get to, we have to stop depending on our strength, our effort, and our ability, and surrender to God. There's a God that loves us and cares for us. And you're gonna hear this week from some people that came to believe that. I don't know what you believe. I don't know what your faith is. But if you'll stay tuned, I believe you'll get locked into the truth and you'll know what it is to be free because that's the purpose you were born for pretty well came to the conclusion that we were out of control last time and of course the only solution is surrendering control to the care of God but before we can do that we have to come to a process that we have decided that that's probably the best thing or the only alternative we've, we have. Uh, what was your journey like? For so much of my life I'd been raised in a Christian home then I went to Bible college. So there was this feeling that God was always part of my life. I never really worried that he was upset with me or disappointed in me. I know some people um, struggle with those things when they're struggling with very real issues. I never felt that. I always took him for granted. And as I was coming out of the denial phase, which lasted 10 years, um, I began to sort of thaw a little bit my heart as far as giving God, a little tiny bit of lordship. <laughs> I hated that word too, you know. And as I did that just a little bit, that's when my relationship with him began to change. In fact, really right now, the last couple of years, it's the first time in my life I've had a relationship. First time I've wanted to read any devotional, you know, because for so long I just took it for granted and thought that it was there. But now as I've allowed him to be lord of a few areas in my life, I'm giving him more and more. And I'm on, and he's leading me on this journey where I'm learning so much about him and wanting to learn so much more about him. So for me, it was very much giving him just a little bit and then being willing to be willing to follow in his will for my life. And it's, it's been a, a gradual process. Growing up, I thought church was for women, kids, and old folks. Kids because they had to go, women because they were weak, and old folks because they had their fun. So I said, well, I'm not going go to I said, I'm not gonna go to church until I get old, until I'm decrepit, until I didn't did all the partying, all the life, all the gambling, all the hanging out, all the drugs I can do. I said, when I'm like done, church time. Yeah, I said, you know, that's when I'm going to go to church. And God said different. Mm. I would get in troubling situations, and I knew from being brought up in the church, that would be the first person I'd call on was God. And he would get me out of situations. I've been stabbed. I've been shot at. Big target, I was missed, close range. And God would get me out of situations, you know, and um, I just knew he was real. I don't know. I, was, I always thought if you were surrendering, you was giving up. You know what I mean? Even quitting smoking was a coward's way out, my daddy used to tell me. <laughs> but I didn't surrender easy. It wasn't gradual. It was all at once. And uh, as I was relating to y'all earlier in the green room, my daughter went off to kill herself. She didn't die, she should have died, and I believe God came and performed a miracle. Not for me, but in spite of me. 
And that night, the love of Jesus broke me. I'd always been a proud person, too proud, stupidly proud, arrogant, egotistical, but he broke me. And that night when I went into my bedroom, I didn't get down on my knees to pray. I fell out on all fours. I'll tell you what, when God overdoses you, it's the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Bam. And, and that's what I don't understand to this day. Don't ask me to explain. I, don't I can't understand it. I, I can't understand what occurred. Because I, I had money in the trunk of the car I was going to go gamble with. In fact, I was going to gamble the day my daughter went to kill herself. And uh, evidently God had a different idea. But I pulled the money out and gave it to my wife and said we need it for hospital bills. And she said, uh, yeah, we will. And she smiled the sweetest smile. And I figured that's what the face of God must look like. I just loved gambling. I loved playing slot machines. At some point, it crosses a line. And once you cross the line, once I crossed that line, I could never go back. That line being that now I was a full-blown gambling addict. I know that when my daughter went to commit suicide and was gone for a day and a, a day and a half, that's it. Because I had $600 in the trunk of the car. In fact, I was going gambling the day she chose to go take her life. Karen came back from shopping, where's Ginger? I said, go back to the house and check the medicine cabinet. She went back and everything was gone. I mean, hundreds of antidepressive pills, Tegretol, which is a sedative, you know, anti-seizure drug. Valium, Xanax, aspirin, you name it. And we figured she was gone to kill herself. I got on the phone, I called a friend of mine with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and he called the Franklin County Rescue Squad, and they were, they, they were out there soon. And they came, boy, they had a lot of men, you know, like 60 or 70 men with three-wheel vehicles and spotlights and walkie-talkies and four or five bloodhounds, air sniffing, ground sniffing. And he said, well, we'll look to midnight and they come in and they hadn't found her. And I prayed, oh boy, we prayed. I wanted God to, you know, let her be found. We got a couple hours rest. I don't know if we slept. Got up the next morning, they were already there, and everybody took off looking, but this day was different. This day they brought the cadaver dogs, the German Shepherd cadaver dogs, which were trained to find bodies. They didn't have the bloodhounds. I had already buried my daughter. Eric Trussell, he came up there and he said, Dr. Eads, we found your daughter. And then he went back to his walkie-talkie and he was looking real stern at me and he said, she's alive. When he, when, when he said she was alive, I got up on my toes, my hands went toward the heavens. I started to wail with joy. That night, we got home from the emergency room. Ginger was going to be okay. No permanent damage. And uh, I, we got there, and we didn't have any street lights out there, but the stars were bright. And I told Karen I was reaching into the trunk, and I told her, I said, I got $600 I need to give you. We're going to need the money, you know, for hospital bills. And, and she said, thank you. And she smiled. She went in the house, and that's when God broke me broke me with his love, and I, uh, I went in the house, and I went in the bedroom, I didn't get down to pray. Uh, on my knees, I just fell out, on my, just prone, just laying out on the floor. I was telling God I was tired of living in the sty, I was tired of sinning, I was tired of being broke, I was tired of lying, I was tired of all the sorry, no good things that I was doing with my life. And from that moment, my life was different.
Have you done all you know to do and it's still not working? Have you tried everything you know to try, spent all you know to spend, and instead of getting better, things are getting worse? Well, let me encourage you today. Jesus told the story about a woman that had a disease of the blood, and we know that life in the flesh is in the blood. She did all she knew to do for 12 long years. She went to all kinds of physicians. She spent every dime she had, but healing didn't come. She kept getting worse. She heard about a power greater than her, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And she said, if I can just touch him, I know I'm going to be made whole. She pushed her way through the crowd. She didn't let anything intimidate her or stop her. And she reached out her hand and touched him. And immediately she was healed. Jesus felt the power leave his body. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? There are people all around you touching you. He said, no, somebody touched me. Do you know that God is looking and He sees and hears the ones that are crying out to Him? Those that have tried everything. She said, he said, who touched me? And the woman said, I did. And He looked at her and He said, your faith has made you whole. Maybe you, like myself, I spent money, I went to different people in different places and I did everything I knew to do to try to get healed of the disease that I had. And whether it's a spiritual disease, a physical disease, a mental disease, whatever it may be, there is one that has all power, and he doesn't cost you anything. The price was paid when he laid down his life at Calvary. They took his clothes from his back and beat him to a bloody pulp so we could be healed spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And if we'll touch him, we'll be made whole. Your faith will make you whole. If you can come to believe that this power that's greater than us, that runs the universe, really cares about us, and He does. He proved how much He cared by sending His Son. And you'll reach out today and touch Him. You'll be made whole too. Money wouldn't cure me. Doctors couldn't cure me. No one could fix me. My family tried. My friends tried. Everybody tried. But just like the woman, instead of getting better, I kept getting worse. And maybe that's how you feel. Well, if you'll just believe, that you, if you touch Him, you'll be made whole. And do it. How do I do it? Just call on His name. Everyone that calls will be saved, and that means you'll be healed, you'll be brought out. There is a power greater than you ready to heal you now. Call on the name of Jesus. Would you explain the difference between compliance and surrender? I certainly will. The, for me, compliance was uh, trying to bend my will so that I could see a result of having, uh, you know, what others wanted be accomplished in me. Yeah. And surrender is saying that there's nothing of my will that will work right for me. I have to give it up. And I will only ask in prayer what God's will is for me and ask for the strength to carry it out. Yeah. The second part that I'm absolutely certain of regarding my journey is that I didn't make it happen. It was by God's grace. But the power behind it, I've come to find out, was other people who love me, praying for me. And it was their powers, their prayers. Yes. It came to my rescue. And how cool is that? I heard two men talking one night, and this guy kept saying, well, I really can't believe in God. And the other man said to him something I thought was very strange. He says, have you ever thought it's because you think that you're God? Mm -hmm. And boy, that really spoke to me, yeah. you know. I, <laughs> like I yeah. thought I owned the planet, you know. And yes. we do before we discover mm -hmm. that we're not God. We're just, you know, we're a grain of sand. But I really thought, that if I had enough things and enough people in this world, I'd be happy. I feel very much like <clears throat> Annie. My journey to surrender was more like a, a forced march to the edge of the cliff. You know? <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw that movie, The Fugitive, when uh, Harrison Ford is an yeah. escaped convict under a death sentence. Tommy Lee Jones is the marshal hunting him down. They wind up at the edge of a dam. Jones has a gun on him and says, come with me. He makes a decision. 
Either I stay with what's familiar, <laughs> like the ground, mm -hmm. and I will definitely die. I'll be taken back to death row and put to death. The other option is I jump, which I think is going to kill me, but it's really my only chance at life. Mm. And, and I think for me, surrender didn't come until I'd exhausted every other possibility. I mean, by the time I repented, uh, the AIDS epidemic was in full bloom. I was certain that I was a candidate for that because of all the different sexual partners I had had. I hadn't been able to sustain a relationship with anyone, male or female, for more than six months. Uh, I knew that if I stayed where I was, I would die physically, spiritually, psychologically. And yet the idea of living without my pornography, without my sexual habits, it felt like that would kill me as well. Because I couldn't conceive of how I would survive. I felt like Harrison Ford jumping off the dam. I know that's the only way I'm going to be able to survive, but I have no idea how I am going to survive that. And the answer only could come by doing it. So for me, surrender simply meant you've run out of every other option. Mm -hmm. Take the dive, even though it feels like it'll kill you to give this up, because that's your only chance at life. And, and I, I liked so much what you were saying, Constance, that in the end, the life you find is so much better. Now, I thought that that surrender was just, all right, this is an act of faith. This is obedience to God. I have to do it. But in the end, w what I thought I was doing for God really uh, has become the greatest favor I ever did myself. I've always believed in God. I believed there was a God, you know, as a young child. Um, I, I didn't believe the world could create itself. That was a bunch of nonsense to me. I was raised to go to church. Well, after I got saved, I was gung-ho for Christ for about a year, but nobody told me how to live for Christ. See, I thought it was a surrender for me was a bunch of rules. I had to learn how to follow the rules, how to live right for God. There were certain things you could do and you couldn't do. Nobody ever came to me and said there's a relationship that had to be established. Surrender came for me when I entered Pinal's Drug and Alcohol Program. And um, one, my primary counselor, she looked at me and she said, you have a religious spirit. She said, you don't have a relationship with God. And you need to pray that God will change your heart so that you can allow him to come in. And um, I gave my heart to Christ while in the program. As through praying and, and devotional time, God became intimate to me. He's, we have an intimate relationship today. It's so very personal. You know, I understand that he's known my name from the beginning of time, that he's had a desire to save me. He knew I wouldn't be able to save myself. That's when the surrender came in, when I, I could admit to myself that there's nothing in my will worthy of anything, that, but through Christ, I'm royalty, I'm set apart, I'm so much more than I ever thought or dreamed, more than the Brady Bunch could ever portray. You know, he just had so much for me, abundant life now and, and, and later. And I just, I, that surrender to me is I have nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else I want to go. There's nowhere else I want to be. He's changing my character. He's growing me. And, and I have never been at a better place in my whole entire life than I am today. My bumping into God happened when I was five years old. I've, I've known him all my life, but I've not been surrendered to him all my life. I was in ministry and not surrendered, thinking that if it was to be, it was up to me. Yeah. Stinking thinking in the ministry. Uh, the truth is, it's all about him. And he is still taking me on a journey of faith. And it is... It's like a kid being lost in a candy store. And, and I am eternally grateful for God's yes. patience yes. with my stupidity and, and my thoughts that that was religion and that was glorifying to him. I cannot do enough to earn what he has done for me. My name is Terry King and today I am a uh... Reverend Terry King, ordained through Elam Fellowship, uh, a new life in Christ. It wasn't always that way. Um, I, I was born into a, an alcoholic family, a tradition of alcoholism. 
um, a tradition of abuse. Uh, and at a very tender early age of eight and nine, I, I became very good at, at drinking, leaving home at an early age. Uh, I was angry, um, bitter, um, and there I was drinking about 12, 18 bottles of beer a day to, to hide the pain. I turned to alcohol. That was my medication. Um, relationships as I've come to know them today in my, in my life prior were all about what you could do for me. My business life, people would say, what an intelligent young man, smart, uh, high IQ, take an IQ test in school, genius. Man, I, I, was, I had this image. And, and so with that image and, and the, the intellect that I thought I had, I could become anybody. Well, in 1986, I, I had uh, $300,000 a year in income. Uh, I had every imaginable toy, uh, president or, or chief executive officer of five different companies at the same time, and condos and home and sports cars and expensive boat and travel and all of the trappings of life. Um, but it was all a facade because I, I was in pain. And, and uh, you know, the, as I reflect back, uh, I was in pain and, and everyone around me that was in my life was in pain because I had money that controlled me and I made sure that money controlled them. And in the back of my mind, I said, this is what society's all about. Television, radio, beer advertisements, that glorious, glamorous life, and I'm living it. So there must not be anything wrong with me. And I kept justifying that for years while my life was unraveling. I had had a number of what I call marker points. I had five or six auto accidents where cars were totaled, rolled over ditches, drove drunk thousands of times, divorced twice, broken relationships, angry kids, lost businesses, bankruptcy. All of those issues of life were marker points what God was saying, pay attention. That wasn't enough. It was a night when I thought I was boldly drinking and driving and living my life and resurrecting my life and business. When I struck and I killed an innocent child of God, a 19-year-old from Buffalo, I, 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 at that moment I knew my life had changed. The Brown family's life was forever changed. They lost their son. And I knew that, that God had said, you need to stop. And it took me going to prison. Some men go to prison, and they don't get it right. But I went to prison seeking to come back to my old life. And I was confronted by a man of God who served over 40 years in prison, who mentored and discipled me and confronted my behavior. And I've come to learn that God provides all of our needs. I left prison with $40 and a set of clothes. And today I have a new life. I have a house and a wife and relationship and a driver's license and a US passport and all the things that others would say you'll never have again. But through his grace and his mercy and his love in his time, those blessings of life, the glory of that relationship unfold in a believer's life when we surrender to his will and his time. Well, you've heard some stories this week that I'm sure have inspired you. I certainly hope so, because that was the purpose of this time that we spent together. First, you believe. Then, you will see. We want to see. Then, we will believe. It doesn't work that way. It takes faith. It's not an easy thing. But the promise from God is that I have given faith to everybody. Some people may have more faith than others because faith is something that grows as we practice it. First you believe, then you will see. My prayer for you today is that that seed that is in you will sprout forth. You will begin to believe because if you begin to believe, 
then you're going to see. You're going to see there's a wonderful life of freedom waiting for you. You're going to see that God loves you more than you love yourself. And once you understand His love and you start loving yourself, you're going to start loving others and wonderful things are going to happen. But it begins with believing. Trust me. I believed and now I see. So I just want to pray for you, okay? Somebody prayed for me and I'm giving back what was given to me. So let's pray together. Father, I just ask you today, I just come to you. You said when two of us get together, you'd be with us. I believe that. May my friend be aware of your presence right there with you, the presence of God right there with you, giving you the faith to believe that there's a power greater than us that can give us what we need. We're asking for it. And he said, if you ask, you'll receive. Believe, then you'll see. That's God's promise because you were born to be free. Have you been inspired to start your journey to recovery? Please call our toll-free number, 888-665-4483, and our prayer partners can help you find a group in your area. Or you can visit our website at www.ctvn.org and click on the Born to be Free link. There you can search our online database of recovery groups near you. When you call or visit our website, request your free copy of the self-help booklet, Your Dynamic Journey to Freedom. In it, you'll find an outline of the recovery process featured in this series. So take that first step on your journey to freedom by contacting us, finding a local recovery group, and getting your free copy of this inspiring booklet. Call now because you were born to be free. Dr. Carl Jung, who's one of our most famous psychiatrists of all times, he himself said that he could not cure alcoholism, that he said that medicine doesn't have the answer. I don't want to be like this. I can't stop. I just can't. And he wanted to get me back into drugs, so he pulled out his needle and his works and pulled up the heroin, put a tourniquet around his arm and he shot right in front of me and I had no pull at all, no pull whatsoever. I counsel so many that aren't in a physical prison with barbed wire and gates and iron cells, but they're in a much deeper prison of the mind and the soul. And that's a prison that I pray every person in our society is freed from in a relationship through Jesus Christ. To others that are currently drugging or drinking or, or running, seeking that medication, we don't have to run. Let that not be the motivation to live our life. Let us not want to go back to relive a life of the past motivated by being somebody other than what God wants us to be.